So the way our show is set up is we just talk the whole time. There's no big Perfect. intro. It's just you and I hanging out, talking about technology. And Excellent. just there's no question I'll ask that you won't know. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so That could be the first. You never know. We'll see. <laughs> we will try. I did, put a, I did put a couple fun questions in. I was really excited Good. to talk with you. I'm actually a Verizon customer. Thank you very much. Yes. Appreciate I, that. I had switched away, mm -hmm. right? And then the cell phone coverage was no good, so I came back. <laughs> All right, good. That's what we like to hear. Yeah. If we haven't had experiential, uh, an experience and you came back. That's perfect. Now, yeah. where, where do you live in Florida? Yeah, I'm in Sarasota, Florida. And it okay. just so happens that the like 15 miles like radius around my house, the, mm -hmm. the only uh, carrier that's good is Verizon. All right. Yeah. Awesome. So you didn't have Fios or anything like that, right? You just uh, you just use this for, uh, uh, for yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, we don't. I have you. I think I have you at my business. I think we're on Verizon right now uh, okay. for the business, but uh, for my home, no. You your we're fiber lines yeah, aren't no, out we there. So we sold a couple markets that we had down in Florida for Fios. We sold a few years ago. So uh, yeah. Get this. So Frontier mm -hmm. buys it, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's April Fool's Day like when a transition happened and one of the main lines in our whole town got cut. So all of Tampa, like the whole city of Tampa was out of internet for like six really? hours on April uh -huh. Fool's day. Oh, really? And I thought everybody was messing with me when I got to the office. <laughs> it was really, it was cut. Oh boy. Yeah. So what does your morning look like? What's your morning routine look like? Um, you know, generally I just, I get in probably seven o'clock in, uh, in the morning and you know, my first thing is just look at what I have planned for the day. And then I typically go through emails and stuff for about an hour. And then, uh, you know, then I just get into the meetings. So typically I try and do my emails and stuff, um, you know, before I get into the day and then I'll do them again at night. Cause you know, they kind of, uh, they build up on you. I, I remember one time my daughter asked me what I do for a living and I told her emails. <laughs> <laughs> How so old you your have daughter? to be careful. You have to be careful. You can get stuck in the, in email hell if you're not careful, right? So, um, so I just I put it, I put uh, time aside for the day to to do that. How old your daughter? Oh uh, well, I have two. I have one that's uh, 17 and one that's 15. Hopefully wow. they're going to be, you know, we'll see. Hopefully they're going to be engineers. They, uh, you know, they're studying uh, science and uh, math and actually coding nice in high school so we'll see if we can get them down the uh down the uh, engineering track both my wife and myself are uh, trained engineers oh amazing so, yeah my father is <laughs> yeah you know i have a 11 month old baby girl oh congratulations yeah so i actually my family has a foundation and we do children's books and for charity mm -hmm. and one of the books we have is called the princess physicist Oh, cool. Yeah. And it's a princess who gets stuck in a tower. But instead of a guy coming to save her, she finds a book about physics under the bed and uses physics to get herself out. That's fantastic. Where, yeah. where can I get that? I'll send you I'd a copy. Oh, that'd yeah. be awesome, man. I'd love to get that. Yeah. It's like one of the children's board books. I thought it'd be cool to be able to read my kid books that we had made. Oh, know? wow. And I really like the story too. That's fantastic. Yeah. Nobody and comes saves her. She figures, she, she uses figures, uh, she uses physics to figure her way out of that. That's awesome. I love That's that. what my daughter would do. So I was like, I gotta make a book for her. <laughs> awesome. I appreciate that. That's cool. So I was talking to Kevin Scott, who's the CTO of Microsoft. Mm -hmm. He's a fantastic human. If you ever get the chance to meet him, just a really cool guy. And he was talking to me about all the different great things that they're doing with the intelligent edge. And okay. so I noticed everybody's bringing up the intelligent edge. I can't get away from it. I want to know what you think of it and what, like what, how is it on your radar? Yeah. Um, you know, it's something, it, it's kind of a term we gave to our overall strategy of really upgrading our networks. Um, so we can build what we call kind of a multi-purpose network. Um, if you look at our history, uh, a lot of our networks were built, uh, for each business unit, if you will, right? So uh, the wireless business unit, we built a wireless network that, that optimized that. If you look at the Fios network, there was a whole set of other engineers building networks uh, to optimize our Fios offering. Uh, same thing if you look at our uh, enterprise business, we had other engineers doing that. So, you know, that was fine. 
Uh, but now the technology has advanced to a point that we can really streamline our networks, make them much simpler, make them flatter, uh, make them easier to operate and really set ourselves up for future technologies. So um, why we call it Intelligent Edge, really in, in our world, it's a lot of different technologies coming together. It's uh, something we call unified transport. So different, uh, different. Um, we have a couple different partners that work with us on the transport piece. Uh, we're working with uh, Cisco and Juniper and others on some really advanced um, uh, routers. Mm -hmm. And um, it all starts with fiber, right? So we're putting a lot of money into fiber. So you take those three things and then you add in 5G and what we call mobile edge compute, uh, which we think is, is going to be a big, a big deal in the, in the coming years. Um, you add that all together and you build a really flexible, um, easy, advanced network that has a lot of intelligence in it and can do really good, uh, we think, really groundbreaking things uh, in the near future. So. You know, it's kind of it's kind of the bedrock of what we're what we're trying to build around here these days. That's amazing. I'm I'm curious. We get a lot of questions from the audience that they want us to ask you, and so I go through all of them and pick a few ones that are interesting. And one guy named Hal he asked about quantum entangled communications. Okay. And this, I, yeah, right. <laughs> I know. I was like, this will be a good one. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to quiz you on the physics of quantum <laughs> entangled communications, but the, the question I extracted from his question was, a, I would like a little insight and you to speak a little bit about how stuff goes from the lab to, to our hands and okay. the commercialization process. How long does that generally take? And yeah, just a few thoughts on that. Yeah, no. So it's, um, it's interesting. I don't know much about that quantum computing stuff and networking. I, I have seen some demos. It seems really cool, but it also seemed like they needed to do it like an ultra cold, you know, um, a lab. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it works in the lab. I promise. <laughs> yeah, if it's really, really cold, but, um, but who knows, you know, there's a lot of smart people working on it. We'll, maybe we'll see something there, but generally it depends on the technology. So, um, if I take something like 4g or 5g, um, that's, uh, that, that's driven a lot by standards bodies and a lot of engineers and technical people working together to come up with standards, um, decide how things are going to work. Then typically vendors, they will take those specs, they'll build, um, you know, chipsets, uh, software gear, and then we'll typically go and put that in our labs. We'll run it through the paces. Um, you know, typically iterate on that a little bit and then, uh, then it's ready for prime time. Go do some FOAs, which is first, app for first office application. We'll test it in the field and then uh, at some point we'll say it's ready for prime time. We'll start deploying and then selling to customers. So, so that's generally if you're talking something like 4G or 5G because, and the reason it needs to be like that is because all of these systems need to uh, work together so and you know people need to be able to take a say for instance a cell phone uh, from the United States and go to Europe and it needs to work so the standard setting process is very important now there's other things uh, we do if we're coming up with a new product or service and that's a little different because in that we're in in that area you know really what we're trying to do is come up with interesting services for our customers whether it be consumer or enterprise what have you and Typically, what we try and do is we look out what is the what is kind of some of the groundbreaking tech that's out there, and then we try and figure out how, you know, is this some kind of tech that we can we can use in house and integrate it with some other things we have, and you know, apply technology to solve issues for our customers. So, kind of two different models for um, you know how we how we develop new things, and they have different timelines too, obviously. Yeah. That's no, that's very insightful. Uh, I'm curious to know about, you mentioned email, but if you were to, obviously you're the CTO of a very large organization, right? Mm -hmm. And so what all the, the mid-level CTOs, maybe their teams of 500,000, 5,000, they're all curious about the pie chart. Like if you were to chunk your day into three pie slices, what would, what would they be? How would that look? You know, it's interesting. Actually, I do, I actually do do that. Um, and what I do is at the beginning of every month, I set out, well, actually I do it every 90 days. I set out what I want to get done in the next 90 days. 
and then I, I write down the four or five things that I want to spend my time on. And I actually decide it's a, it's a pie chart and I decide how much of my time on each one I want to spend. And then I actually go at the end of every week and I look to see if I did that or not. And what that does is it helps me stay focused. Obviously, in, a, in an organization this large with so many things going on, I can easily get distracted and not major on the majors, as, uh, as our chairman says. And uh, so I make sure that I actually quantitatively sit down, write it down, think about it, and uh, execute on that. Who is that that you mentioned? Uh, our CEO, Lowell McAdams. He always says something. He always has the term about majoring on the majors. And yeah, really you don't want to major on the minors. Don't, don't major on the minors, right? And that's, uh, you know, I, it, it, uh, as you kind of move up the chain of command, uh, it gets more crucial that you do that. And, you know, hey, listen, there's sometimes there's things that are really cool that I like to spend my time on, but it's not what I'm paid to do. So, um, you know, I got to make sure I stay focused. That's incredibly important. The focus is the determining difference between the people who achieve the success and, and they don't. Uh, you mentioned you're at the top. So you've had to work your way there. Nobody just arrives at the top and it's just magical. I'm curious to know a little bit about your path, how you got started in technology and then how you leveled up to where you are today. Sure. So I, um, I mean, it's a kind of a long story, but just in a nutshell, I, I went, uh, I have a degree in mechanical engineering uh, just because that's what interest, it, it interested me the most. Uh, and then when I was getting ready to graduate, I was looking at different um, – you know, I think it's important to look, you know, where do you want to go work? And, you know, the mobile, mobile phones were just coming onto the scene. And, I, you know, it looked like a really cool technology that, that had some legs and an interesting. So, so, so I hopped from, you know, kind of mechanical engineering, what one would think a mechanical engineer might do. And I hopped over into basically more of an electrical engineering type, type scenario. And I was hired by 9X Mobile as a cell site technician um, in the, in the late eighties. And, uh, you know, I took care of cell sites and at the time it was brand new technology. Um, you know, I got to work with really smart people at Bell Laboratories. Um, when I started, I think we had 75 cell sites, you know, today we have tens of thousands, 70,000. So, um, I learned right, right, uh, right, you know, hands-on experience from day one being a cell site tech. And then as time went on, I got to get involved in other different kind of technologies in, um, you know, kind of uh, crypto and security, uh, designing new technologies. I've been around for all of the G's, as they say. So 1G, 2G, 3G, 5G. <laughs> so I've been, I've been here for all the G's and I've seen the whole industry grow from, uh, you know, from really its early, its early days. Um, I've been very lucky and the, the company has I, I've done a good job. They're very thoughtful about how they, um, you know, keep increasing your skills and see, you know, what you can handle. And I've been very lucky that I've got to, um, I've been given a lot of different jobs where I've been able to learn from, you know, technology development, engineering, construction, you know, finance, business development, products, uh, networks. So um, it's just, I've just had a great ride and, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate and humbled that, um, you know, the, the company has um, thought enough of my skills and abilities to allow me to run this great organization. Oh man, I'm all, I'm getting all pumped up here in this. All right. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, I like geek out over technology and leadership. I'm like, tell me about that path. What yeah. was, tell me about the first time that you got the opportunity to lead a team and how it didn't work out. No, but uh, yeah. <laughs> they're like what you so learned. Much. Yeah. Well, it almost, the, the, the trend here is that it virtually never does. You get your, you get your experience, you know, but you get it as a leader. So I'm curious to know, um, you know, how far were you in your career when you got your first chance to lead a team and what was, what's the one lesson that still sticks in your mind from then? Yeah, I was, I was very lucky since we were, you know, I was in this thing very early on, uh, the wireless uh, company that I was at, 9X Mobile, was, was relatively small. So, uh, frankly, I started managing a team uh, probably when I was like 23, 23 or 24. You know, frankly, had no experience at all, but that's, that's how you learned. It wasn't a big team. It was a team of maybe 10 folks. Um, but ever since then, I've had, um, I've had, you know, 
ever increasing, you know, sometimes larger teams, sometimes smaller teams. Each one is different depending on, you know, what you're trying to accomplish. I, I've led teams that uh, are kind of more operations oriented. Uh, that's, uh, you know, they, they, they tend to, you know, you manage that a little differently than say I'm uh, managing a whole bunch of a group of, uh, you know, people who are doing technology development and really into the bits and the bytes of the tech, right? It, it, there's kind of different, uh, uh, different methods to manage those teams. But, uh, you know, it's really just a learning experience. You, you got to hop into the pool and, you know, work with people. You got to figure out what motivates folks, um, get everybody lined up and uh, charging in the same direction. That's the, that's the key. Now, so when you were, when you were learning, did you just sort of surround yourself with some great people who knew more than you, or did you with some like certain books or different leaders that you learned from uh, like their, you know, books or audio programs, whatever it may be like, where, where did you pull your resources to upskill yourself in those areas? You know, I, I think it's basically experiential. I've been very lucky. I've had some, I've had some great bosses mm -hmm. and I've learned e each and every one. I've learned something, you know, from them and you know that, and I really think it's experience. Sure. You know, you read papers, you know, I was in business, I went to business school. Um, so you read, you know, you read some academic stuff about it and, you know, read HBR or whatever. Um, but it's really about, you got to deal with people one-on-one. -on -one. And you got to be able to motivate folks and you got to be able to come up with a vision that people believe in. You have to sell it and you have to, you have to, um, you know, treat people fairly. Um, I'm a big believer in, you know, you, you, you set goals for folks and you, you, you ask them to go to a certain place and, and um, you know, then innovation happens and good folks come up with new ways of, of doing things and you embrace that as opposed to, you know, sitting on top of folks and, and, and managing, micromanaging people that never, uh, I learned that really early on. That doesn't really, uh, that doesn't do anything. That yeah, that, that makes but it really, worse. <laughs> really, what, it's just really experiencing um, and gaining knowledge over the years on, on what works and what doesn't. Yeah. So paying attention to, you know, what other bosses and leaders are doing around you and then taking what you like or don't like from each person and kind of blending it into your own. Yeah, and burning my own style, right, man? Yeah. just you know, it's funny. We just, we have some interns here and I was talking to them yesterday and they were asking about leadership and I'm like, you know, you got, you got to be you, right? Just do you. And, um, don't try and be anything that's not, uh, you know, that's kind of fake because people see right through that. Just be your own person and do you and then maximize you and, and everything will be okay. Yeah. And then get more experience. <laughs> Absolutely. Just get, well, man, and it goes back to getting, you know, I've been very lucky. Just keep trying to find different experiences that you can learn from. I'm, you know, right now, this is great for me. I'm learning so much in this, uh, in this role. It's fantastic. And I always ask people just always be inquisitive, keep learning. That's the kind of people I want here. I want people who are inquisitive. They want to learn new things. They want to upskill. Um, they want to learn new technologies and see how they can apply them to our business to help our customers. And that's, you know, you surround yourself with good people like that, good things are going to happen. Lots of innovation, like you mentioned. So I was speaking with one of my brother's friends. He runs one of the larger EMT slash fire counties in the United States, okay. it's yeah. like down in Naple Lee County down in Florida. Okay. And for some reason, they're just exceptionally large. And they, he was showing me some of the really cool predictive analytics that they could do about when emergencies would happen, he's like, look, we know that this many calls is like, a, is going to come from this area on these types of days. And I was just blown away by what they were able to do with the amount of data that they have of, you know, managing emergencies in that geographical region for X amount of time. Right. Mm -hmm. yep. And so you guys have incredible amounts of data, right. About just everything. And so you must have tremendous capabilities for, to do some amazing things with machine learning and predictive analytics. I'm curious to what's, what's going on on that front. Actually, it's one of the, it's one of the areas that uh, I'm most excited about now uh, because here's an area where you talk about the intelligent edge network. This is an area that I'm really, you know, I'm super excited about because we can really change the way we do things. And we started on this journey probably five, six years ago. And, and if you know anything about telecom, there's the, you know, typically carriers have these things called NOCs and it's really a, a network operations center. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And, you know, for the last hundred years, really what those things are is they're places where our technicians sit and alarms come in. So all of the millions of different devices that we have out in our network, you know, sometimes cards fail, boxes fail, things fail. And generally what happens is an alarm comes in. Um, and then we'd send somebody out to fix it. You know, not, not very exciting, uh, you know, in, in this day and age. So what we're trying to do is um, change that. So instead of alarms coming in, we're trying to characterize at very deep levels um, how the network works and how they function and how different events in one part of the network, we can correlate it and, and understand what an outcome might be somewhere else. And, you know, one area that I like to talk about is we're getting very good at predicting failures, almost like you're saying, we're getting good at predicting cards failing uh, before they actually fail. So you go back 10 years, you know, the card would fail, alarm would come, we'd send somebody out to fix it. Now we can gauge with very good precision, like 99%, uh, when a certain card may fail, you know, within a, a week or two's time. And that really is helpful for our customers because we can change that card out before it fails and anybody sees any impact, right? So it's those kind of things that, you know, um, uh, you know and, it, and once again, it's our people. They're upskilling themselves to learn the new, the new tech and how to apply it and uh, make our networks run better. So, so that's really, you know, I'm, I'm super excited about that. It's early days of this. Uh, we are, we're skilling up there. We're hiring folks in that area. We're setting up a framework to really be able to leverage it across the whole company, not just in network. Um, so, you know, it's really, it's an exciting time for that perspective. Yes. I'm very excited because I was just talking about this last week with Dennis. He is the senior vice president or a C CEO. I think he's the CEO or senior vice president of Canon, you know, like okay. the yeah. they do cameras, yeah. imaging. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And they, they do an incredible amount with imaging and networks and infrastructure. And they, he's actually only about an hour from you mm -hmm. uh, physically. And he's a great guy, like super cool. You get along with him. You should definitely meet him. And sure. he, uh, he was telling me about this big push that they're doing now. So they can actually proactively swap out different pieces of equipment and they, they're getting it to the point where they're calling you up and say, hey, this is going to break in two weeks. We're going to come out there and replace it. Right. Yeah. Same idea. Same idea. I love it. And he's probably working on, you know, it, what's cool about he's working, you, you bring up imaging. You know, that's, it's a, that is a great use case for the Intelligent Edge Network because there's a lot of work going on in the world about, you know, image recognition and, you know, manipulation and using video um to do advanced you know advanced things right especially in smart city applications yeah and that's really where the intelligent edge network comes in with 5g so if we you know as we're deploying 5g we have super you know super great uh latency characteristics with 5g and we have some mobile edge compute there um guys like you know the fellow you know at canon and people who are doing like uh, a lot of advanced uh, imagery um stuff uh, this will really give them a leg up and really move the move the whole science forward. Yeah, it's amazing how how life works and how these great companies are doing these things in these similar spaces but differently. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I love it and just so much brilliance. Also, like the CTO of William Sonoma, they acquired. You know, they're like the kitchen company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I buy stuff they, from them. <laughs> oh yeah, they're awesome. Okay, they're uh, Yazir or Yazir. He's uh, the CTO over there. Mm -hmm. They're, they also own Pottery Barn, which was news to me, but they acquired because they're making, you know, everybody wants to do the AR stuff with the cameras. Mm -hmm. And yep. so they, they acquired this like hundred person AR company and used them, pulled them into their company and then digitized all their products. So now in the near future, I don't know if it's publicly available yet. You're just mm -hmm. going to be, able, your wife's going to be able to spend money <laughs> without leaving the kitchen more so than on Amazon. Yeah. You can see what it looks like. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's what we're betting on. Part of this, what we're building these networks for is, you know, I, I believe AR and VR are going to be, you know, it's going to change the way people do things. It's going to be a whole new platform and we're early days of that too. But to do, to do any mixed reality, virtual reality, augmented reality, to do it well, you need to have the latency characteristics that you would get with uh, um, with 5G. 
right? Yeah. On 4G, the uh, why 4G is a fantastic technology. Um, people love it. It's uh, but for doing like any kind of application that's really latency sensitive, we need something a little more uh, uh, advanced. And that's where 5G is going to come in. We'll get down to we'll get down to single di digit millisecond um, uh, latencies with uh, with 5G. So um, it'll be it'll it'll make AR VR unbelievable. And since it's wireless, you'll be able to move around, right? You won't have to have. You've probably seen a lot of these AR VR de demonstrations where people are wearing a, you know, an Alienware computer on their back. <laughs> but that's like we, we, yeah. we, we like to build a network and a platform that allows people to. Maybe you just need your goggles on. You don't need to have all the other ancillary gear with you to get a great experience. Right. I'm looking forward to the day where we no longer have the the web in the sense that the wires need to go like around and be drilled like when we could just get it from the satellites well or or the wireless yeah. network how's that well, yeah the wireless <laughs> network well i mean you guys see elon musk and those companies do putting the clusters up there like the micro satellites and sure. we're just going to get more of that right um there's a lot of companies looking at um there's a few different ones that i know of that are are looking at uh you know, doing some kind of wireless data over either balloons or satellites or low, low earth orbit satellites, et cetera. Um, and I, you know, there's probably, there's probably, um, you know, use cases for that. But uh, for us, we're, we're really focused on our, you know, traditional having uh, antennas mm -hmm. uh, on the ground and, and uh, connecting them with fiber and the intelligent edge network. So that's, that's where we're putting our bet. So that's important right now. Yeah. That's like what, all right, good. That's See, exactly I, don't know. Like, I come yeah. talk to you, so you tell me. <laughs> yeah, no, that's exactly <laughs> right. So that's what we're spending a lot of our time putting out the infrastructure for 5G. Yeah. Uh, we announced we're going to do some uh, fixed uh, wireless um, trials this year. Uh, we announced three cities that we're going we're gonna to do it in. One, the last one we just announced was Houston. So we're out there right now putting in the fiber and the antennas that allow us to... Uh, to start selling that to customers and we'll be uh, we'll be doing that this year what that's amazing yeah good that i'm like pumped up because you know i've been watching these videos of like i think a couple car companies did it did some videos about what would be uh possible with 5g mm -hmm. essentially the real-time style communication and i saw a couple of them and i was like whoa so that brings up the question we you just answered about houston's getting this when when will 5G be commonly available in the United States? Well, next year we've you know we will be deploying um, uh, the technology. We're deploying it this year, but we're really going to gain speed next year, and you'll start seeing um, a lot of these services in 2019. So next year you'll start seeing it. We're already working, however, we're not waiting until the thing's deployed. We're out working with a lot of our partners in the tech world to come up with what are what are the what are the interesting things that consumers would like and enterprises would like to use the platform for so we're out there developing it uh right now we're working with a lot of the thought leaders in the tech world um so when the platform is out there and ready to be used there'll be useful applications that can plop right on top right away so a lot of work going on there are there 5g phones out for purchase now well, actually, we did. Uh, we announced uh, last week that uh, um, there is a 5G capable device, a, um, a, a Motorola device, and I think we made that announcement uh, a few days ago, last Thursday. Right. So that's going to be that's the first uh, 5G capable device. Um, at uh, when the chipsets are ready, there'll be a, a jetpack or not a jetpack. There'll be a um, a, a mod goes right onto the phone so then you'll be able to use 5g right away and then we have a host of other you know the de developments and, and uh, stuff we're working with our partners on right now so when the network's ready we will have the devices ready as well i'm excited yeah, i'm like i'm like really pumped up. like are you guys ahead of I your am. competition is anyone ahead of you are you are you right in line with someone like are you are you leading the pack no i think you know we're leading the pack we've uh we've had a tradition of doing this you know, we were the first uh, to push LTE. We were out there first with that. We were driving the industry to go to LTE. And the same can be said for 5G. We've been out leading the pack on this one. Um, we will be first to the market. 
and uh, we not only will be first, we'll be best. So yeah, well, you know, honestly, so I, I really like, I pay the extra money because the network works good and I like the quality, but also I find it like shopping like Target versus Walmart. It's just a nicer experience. Like I just want, I want to go to the higher end. Like I know it's a little bit more, but it's a better experience. It's easier on me. I don't have to worry about it. You're nothing, no Verizon junk is ever going to hit my to-do list. The bill gets paid. The thing works. I appreciate that. I appreciate you being a customer and yeah. uh, I appreciate you being an ambassador for us. That's fantastic. Yeah. Were there any other topics that you wanted to touch on that you're really excited about? Uh, I know you said you're very excited about the predictive analytics. We talked about 5G. Everyone's really pumped about that. Yep. Anything else? Yeah, no, I know. I think those are the, you know, when we talked about before about how I spend my time, those, the things we just touched on are really how I'm spending my time. The only other thing is, uh, probably that I leave you with is, you know, 4G is still what we're spending, you know, most of our time on our resources and our money uh, to continue is to continue to advance uh, 4G just because 5G is coming doesn't mean 4G is going away anytime soon. It's 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 fundamental to what we do. And we're, we have a lot of new technologies going on there, like uh, something called carrier aggregation. Um, so we can have different type, uh, different frequencies, you can kind of bond them together to get faster speeds uh something called mimo four by four mimo we have multiple antennas in the device and in the network that uh, and something called 256 qualm so anyway these are just kind of techniques and technologies that we are putting in our lt advanced footprint throughout the country so your your hopefully not hopefully it will your service should uh, continue to improve um as as we put these things into the network so these technologies are ways that you're actually enhancing the current 4G network. You betcha. And Ooh. we spend a lot of time in our uh, engineers spend a lot of time on, uh, you know, deploying these, uh, these technologies and these optimizations and uh, um, our customers will start uh, benefiting from them here. So we continue to spend a lot of time making sure our network is the best network in the country. So going from four to five, that's like one, right? Mm -hmm. But how, how much of an improvement is it really? It's, it's, um, it adds a lot more capacity uh, to the network, which means you're going to always get a, a consistent and, you know, good experience. And, and how we know this is because we do a lot of testing of our network. There's a lot of various different um, um, ways you can test your network. Um, one way is we do something called drive testing. A company called Root Metrics does a lot of, they send vehicles out into the world and drive the different networks and they compare against each other. And um, in all the studies that you see, um, we always show, you know, all these independent studies show we have the best networks. And we're gonna, we're gonna keep doing that. And we're gonna keep applying technologies to our already incredible network that uh, make it even better and keep us in the lead. So that's what we spend our time on. Are you a, are you a fan of Elon Musk? You know, I don't, I, 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 I don't, I don't read much about him. I think it's pretty cool what he's done with these, uh, these cars, what he's doing to the car industry. Um, I mean, it seems what about like the rockets. Guy. Yeah. The rocket seems cool, but there's a bunch of people doing that too. So, I mean, I, 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 I I'm a fan, I guess, but yeah. I don't know. I don't follow him too much. I gotta be honest with you. There's him. There's uh Branson, you know, uh, Richard Branson. And then yeah. there's Bezos. Mm-hmm. It's all the billionaires doing the rockets. They're all doing rockets. Yeah. So I read, I, I bought all their uh, biographies, their life stories, right? Uh -huh. And I, and I read them all. And, uh, and so I'm like, this is the path to be, to do, to the billionaire rocket club. Okay. Well, <laughs> good luck. So I, I want to tell you, we're not going to be doing that. I don't think we're going to be shooting rockets here at Verizon. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we, but here's, here's a question for 5G, right? Cause it might be able to help, right? Mm -hmm. Cause they have to communicate. Right. And so, would we be able, we might be able to help Elon and all them. He wants to go to Mars, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. If he offered you a ticket, would you go? If he offered me a ticket, would I go? You yeah. know what? I don't think so. Cause I think it would take me far too long to get to Mars and I'm not sure what the return ticket looks like. Right. And it's <laughs> dusty, right? I don't, I think I'm staying here, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I was, so I was talking, um, we're, we have the CTO of the SpaceX coming on, oh, right? Cool. Yeah, so yeah. I'm really, and then we had, you know, Roomba, they like iRobot, they make the yes. little robot. And yeah. so I said, all right, well, I'll bring you guys value because we'll do a special mission because Mars is so dusty. We'll mm -hmm. get Verizon involved. 
we'll build an army of Roombas and we'll send them on a ship ahead of time to clean up Mars. That sounds like a good use case. Yeah, and yep. then you guys can you know, coordinate the digital connection and yeah, that's, that's something 5G, the 5G Roomba army. Count us in. There you go. <laughs> and Canon will take pictures of it. There you go, there you go. <laughs> Oh man, Kyle, man, this has been so much fun. I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for coming on the show and yeah, hanging out. Yeah. yeah, and we'll just loop back and uh, give you the air date and uh, the, all the quick clips and all the good stuff that comes along with, with the show. And, and just thank you again for your time. Yeah, I appreciate what you're doing, man. It's pretty cool. I went onto yeah. your site and I, I, I listened to some of the stuff. So, um, oh, nice. It's a pretty, it's a pretty cool thing. So uh, I appreciate your time as well.